announcements. So first of all, Mr. Christman, if you would. Thank you. Um, it is uh, my responsibility to make sure you know that the youth are selling apple dumplings for, well, today. And they are prepared. They are homemade. If you haven't purchased them, come by and, and see me. I'll hang out over in the 
um, the refreshment line a little longer, uh, but they, uh, the youth have, have put those together uh, lovingly and would love for you to enjoy them. So homemade apple dumplings, they're $20 in order. They do store well in a freezer and make good gifts. So uh, thank you for your consideration. And then if I can, since I'm up front, uh, just want to bring to your attention, next week is uh, Calvary's. Uh, third annual week of giving, and uh, so we appreciate the support that we've received from you throughout the years, and, and uh, this is a great um, stepping stone towards the end of the year to just continue to support the ministry that, that God has uh, afforded us at Calvary Lutheran High School of telling his story to, uh, to teenagers and, and uh, preparing them for a life of impact in our, in our community. So thank you for your time. Very good. All right. And piggybacking off of uh, your generosity to Calvary and our kids, I just wanted to update you guys last year. Uh, the Sunday school class had donated uh, monies towards the uh, teenagers who were going to the March for Life in Washington, D.C., and then it got canceled. So I just wanted you all to know that we've held on to those monies. We still have a, 30, a group of 31 going again this year. Uh, it is that next last week in January, of, uh, we have 23 kids and eight adults who are going to the March for Life. So uh, really excited. Some of them, some of the kids going are unchurched, and I think, you know, they're, they're stepping up kind of out of their comfort zones. And I just appreciate and want to say thank you to all of you who um, – donated uh, to that last year, and I just wanted to let you know uh, what you are giving is giving back to our kids and encouraging them to do. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Trina. Okay. All right. Um, good morning again. Good to see everyone. You should have a sheet on your table. Uh, for those of you joining us online, you have a sheet online on our website. Uh, please take a look at that so you can follow along. Maybe there's something... Uh, uh, to remember later on for a conversation you'll have uh, at another time. If you're sitting around somewhere off a table, there are some extra sheets floating around. If there aren't six people at a table, uh, there are sheets on those tables. So uh, help yourself to those uh, and uh, pens are up here and, and so forth. So let's begin with a short word of prayer, if I may, and, uh, and then we'll dive in today. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your love, uh, for your truth, and uh, most importantly, Lord, for today, your word, uh, for your word changes lives. And so on this All Saints Day, uh, we remember those who have gone ahead of us, not just the members of this church, not just the members of our families, but Lord, over the, the history of mankind, those that trusted you, uh, those that put you um, in, in the proper place in their lives, in the preeminence of their lives. Uh, Lord, I thank you for that gift of faith. And uh, Lord, we look forward to that reunion in heaven when all nations come together around the throne. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. So this morning, uh, again, so jumping into this, our fourth week uh, out of this, just to remind you a little bit of where we're, uh, where we're going, where we've been. And uh, so today we're going to talk about the teachings of Jesus. Remember, uh, we've kind of pointed at this uh, uh, this um, theme verse uh, of Luke 9, 51, as everything that we're going to take a look at is he, Jesus, set his face to go to Jerusalem. And that doesn't seem like a very dramatic verse, as I've said before, but it is the reason Jesus came, right? Even though uh, I, I think we all love Christmas, uh, but Christmas is simply the moment that God entered into the world, keeping his promise. But he didn't accomplish uh, salvation by coming into the world. He accomplished salvation on Easter. And even though Christmas is a wonderful, emotionally charged holiday, uh, it is not the reason that Christ came. He always came to save us because he understands eternity, and, and whereas you and I, we don't really, and, and we don't really focus on it all that much. Um, we kind of go, I want this life to be comfortable and good and, and, and you know, blessed and so forth. And God's willing to do that. As we're going to show a little bit today through his teaching, um, even in his teaching, he was focused upon salvation and the cross and what is to come. So let's um, take a walk through this, uh, the teachings of Jesus. So in Luke 6, there's a sermon on the plain. Now, I made a point of that because it is not the Sermon on the Mount, right? It is different. Now, I'll tell you, if you read it, and I always encourage you to look over these things, that's why they're listed there, you'll find some similarities, right? Because Jesus, as the teacher, taught same things to different groups of people. 
He didn't say, okay, you in Galilee, you're going to hear all about the end times. But you guys over here outside of Bethany, I'm not going to tell you anything about the end times. Right? There's some similarities and some teaching that does overlap a little bit. So if you would, would you open up to Luke chapter 6? Luke chapter 6. And uh, would somebody read out of Luke 6, uh, verses 20 through 26? 20 through 26. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. <coughs> Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to, did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. All right. Thank you, David. So well, I want you to understand, first of all, in Jesus' teaching, it's, under, it's important to understand the context. Here he's speaking to his followers, his disciples. Right? So a lot of times we'll pull things out of Scripture and go, this is on the job application. Right? If you'd like to follow Jesus, here's what you're going to face. The woes and the blessings. Right? And, uh, and, and that's not really what the, these things are. In fact, I'll go as far as saying this. These words are pronouncements, not commands. And what I mean by that is if you are a follower of Jesus, those things that were listed off that David just read 20 through 26, those things will be true. Now, I, I want you to, this is always helpful for me. It's a little sobering at times too. If those things aren't things you experience, guess what? If you don't experience those things that are listed in 20 through 26, you're not following Christ. Right? So those are, you're just kind of like, whoo, I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm not, I, haven't, I don't have any woes. Right? And, and Jesus is going, no, this is a pronouncement. This is a description. This isn't a, hey, start, start woeing. Right? Start suffering. Start struggling. You have to purposely invite those things in. The things he's listed there in scripture, you will endure those things when you follow Jesus. Some of you know that. Some of you have made decisions maybe in your, your career or your vocation or your family where, where people start to kind of push back against your belief system because you've made uh, a distinction. That is wrong and I won't do it. Or this is the right thing to do and I have to do it. Not kind of, well, you know, I don't know if I should. I don't know if I will. That's not following Jesus. It's, it's getting there. Um, so I, I want you to understand as Jesus teaches these things, they aren't simply a list of the job description. If you're going to follow me, you got to, you know, people got to struggle with you and you got to push back against things and so forth. If you are a follower, first and foremost, those things will be true. Everybody understand? Okay. All right. Because the trajectory of the Christian life is contrary to the world's. Jesus says that all the time. Right? It, it, is, it is contrary to the world. Um, the things that the world chases after should not be the things that you and I chase after. Most people that live in this world outside of a relationship with God are living for this moment. The old Viking adage, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Right? That's the Viking adage. That was kind of directed their lives. They weren't even in mindset of eternity. They were just like, get all you can now, do what you can now, and because when you're dead, it's just a dirt nap. That's it. It's over. Lights go out. That's all. And yet as Christians, as people that follow Jesus and understand, why did you save us? It's not to make this life heaven. It's to open up heaven and, and to escape the judgment that is rightfully ours, that being hell. And so we have a different perspective. So the things that you and I chase after shouldn't be the finite things, the temporary things, instead eternal things. Jesus says it over and over, right? Don't store up things on earth, things that don't last. Instead, store up in heaven. And you're like, well, what do I store in heaven? Well, I got news for you. It isn't money. It isn't things, right? It's, it's just those acts, that fruit of faithfulness that is, is uh, produ uh, productive here in this life. So our trajectory is different. Jesus is always pointing that out. Again, I love how Luke approaches this. This is only my own personal opinion. Um, I think Luke approaches 
the knowledge and relationship with Jesus in a somewhat analytical way, which, which I respond to. If, if you are more of a, if, if you're more of a right brain person, if you know that they're more creative, a little more artistic and imaginative and so forth, you'll like John more. Because John talks more about poetic love and, and what that means and kind of gets these, paints these broad stroke pictures of Jesus' relationship. Luke just kind of, you know, he's, he's, um, he's, he's Sergeant Friday, right? Just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. And, uh, and I appreciate that. So as he points that out, he goes, listen, I'm going to point out the world goes this way. Jesus calls us to do this. Now you're in the world. And, and that's important. You and I have to live in this world. We cannot circle up the wagons as church and just wait for Jesus to come back. That's the biggest sin as a church, I think, other than just rejecting God. Because God says, if I gave you faith and I didn't call you home at that moment, guess what? You have a work to do. And the work is to be my representatives, to make my name famous in this world. That's really what he's called us to do, all right? Make God notable in this world. So what does this struggle, right, against the world produce? When you and I struggle against the things in this world, struggle against, you know, the idea of gathering more and more, we're surrounded by it, right? Uh, in fact, I'll be a little critical, uh, we in America are among the wealthiest people on the planet, on the planet, Right, most people, a good portion of people, I think. What I was reading, um, there was a Bible study I did here a couple of years ago now, Hole in the Gospel, and uh, it was uh, kind of came from a, a book that I read called Hole in the Gospel by uh, the new CEO for World Vision, I think is what it was. I think he was World Vision, and he was just giving some statistics and and the, the percentage of people in the world. I think it was up to. 20% of the population on the planet live on less than $2 a week. I'm pulling that somewhat out of my memory, but it, it's somewhere in there. Because when you think of the billions of people in, in China and in India alone in Africa, you can understand that. So you $2 a week, right? You, you can't buy a coffee for $2, right? Uh, too often. So we see that kind of go. So as Christians, my point is in this, is that we have gotten caught up right, in the, in the culture of America, right? You and I, we, we have savings accounts and retirement accounts and we live comfortably and so forth. And I'm, I'm not just beating us over the head, but you understand what would look different if God's church in America were just getting by with subsistence living? Would that look different to everybody? To the outside world, right? They would, they would look at Christians and go, why, why don't you have more than one car, Right? Why, why do you have that kind of house? Why, why do you not have stores of food and, and your retirement plan and all those kind of things? Because we have, we have to be honest about it, we have been caught up. So the struggle against it is meant to create something. God knew we were going to go headlong upstream against the world that's coming downstream. And he goes, I want you to struggle with this. That's why he points it out. That's why he says, listen, don't store up on earth. Right? Because why? Because we do. Usually when a parent tells a child don't do something, it's because they did or are doing something. They don't just go, hey, listen, don't, uh, don't steal a car. I know you're four, but don't steal a car. Probably not a risk like that at four years old. Okay? Um, and, and so we see this. So what is what happens? Well, when this struggle in this world where we go headlong into things and so forth and we get sucked into sin, it creates in us a longing for a Savior. Because when you struggle in this world and there are consequences for it, and you say, when I sin, which means I go against a predetermined design of God, God's holiness is the framework in which you and I live. It's his holiness. They're his rules. Uh, I often, uh, people don't like debating with me uh, sometimes because they'd rather just debate with me. And, and what I usually debate with is God's word. Right? They're like, I just want to argue with you and what you think. And I'm like, I might not be very good at it. Right? So a lot of times what I will just kind of come down to saying is like, but that's what God says. Oh, but I don't believe that. I'm, I'm sorry. That's how I'm called to live. God says this. But when people wrestle with some of the issues today, these hot button issues that, that trigger us all and things like that, almost all of those issues, unless they're really cloudy, come right back down to what does God say? What's God's word say? Because as Christians, that's where we've got to stand. We can't go, oh, God says this, but I don't want to make enemies with this person, so I'll kind of find some place 
in the middle somewhere. And then we end up being kind of vague, ambiguous Christians. Like, the Bible's really important, unless, of course, it makes me uncomfortable. And then I kind of downplay it, right? I had somebody ask me the other day some of the stands that their particular church body um, differed from our particular church body, and they wanted to debate it. And I just said, but God says this. Well, I know that, but I want to know how come. And I'm like, no, there, it doesn't really matter what my opinion is. Uh, God doesn't say, here's my rules. Unless, of course, you'd like to redefine them in some way, and then therefore, those are the new rules. Because that's obviously the problem with us. Um, you know, you, you guys know this. Every time we get a new rule, we try to find a loophole. Right? It's just, it's our natural tendency. <clears throat> Adam and Eve, don't eat fruit from that tree, but it looks good. Right? Don't, don't eat that tree or you'll die. Yeah, but I think you're holding out on us. Right? It would have just been simple to just don't eat the fruit. It wasn't like they were going hungry. Right? There was everything they needed was there in the garden, and yet they just didn't go, ah, he didn't say don't touch it. Right? Touch it. Looks good. Right? Smells good. Adam, come here. You got to see this. I don't care what he said. Just come over and look at it. We're not eating it. Right? Like my brother when we were on trips, right? Don't touch me. Right? Don't touch me. Okay? Same thing. So what do we find? Um, would you guys look, if you're still open to Luke chapter 6, 27 through 30. Listen to this list of things uh, that Jesus is teaching his followers. Somebody read 27 through 30, please. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. So these are not pronouncements. These are commands, right? Because you can hear it. Love those who persecute you. Um, I'm not asking for a show of hands, but I want you just in your heart go, do you do that? Do you love the people who persecute you? I don't know. I didn't say, do you tolerate? Do you say evil things behind their back, not to their face? Do you talk to other people about them, but not them? Right? No, do you love them? Love them enough to share Jesus with them. Love them enough to turn the other cheek. Love them enough. So it goes on. So you see this, you're like, oh, that is a hard list. Right? Turn the other cheek. Do good to those. Bless those. Pray for those. But here's the sad thing for us as humans. It is a radical list of commands. But Jesus did them. And, and that's what he's calling us to follow. Um, he's not asking us to do something we cannot attempt to do. Uh, we can't do it like Jesus. Jesus did it perfectly. But he is calling me to do it. I am to, I am to pray for my, uh, my enemies. Those that persecute me. Those that are mean to me. Those that hurt my feelings. Those that do things that are contrary to what God calls us to be and to do. He calls me to love them. Not just put up with them. Not just, you know, kind of wince a little bit and be tough and so forth. He says, I want you to love them. Love them back. Because what could that love demonstrate? God. If Jesus did this and you and I start to act like Jesus, who are they likely to be, you know, interested in and turn to and, and seek to follow and kind of go, well, you turned your back on, you know, uh, on, on this evil or this bad in the world and so forth and took the heat for it. And, and I want to know why. Why would you do that? Because everyone else around does this. Right. I, I, uh, I read a book once when I was in, in high school, it was in youth group, and it was if the world fits, you're the wrong size. If the world fits, you're the wrong size. It was kind of this funny little cartoon. That's why I remember it. It's a guy wearing a great big globe like a costume. Right? He's just head popping out and his legs down the bottom, his hands out. And, uh, and I, that's just stuck with me ever since. I shouldn't look like the rest of the world. I shouldn't sound like the rest of the world. Um, one of the times that I see that happening when there's conflict, right? Um, like around a presidential election, right? I start to hear our Christian brothers and sisters start to sound like everybody else start to say things and post things and stuff like that. We should be different. One of the ways we should be different is go, it's going to be hard, folks, perhaps. But the fourth commandment says we honor those in authority. God put them there. And you go, but I, I don't want to do that. I want to criticize. I want to overthrow it. I want to uh, undermine it. And you're like, that's not what God says. And so when your friends or you know your uh, associates kind of say, well, I want to say this and say that, and kind of go, I can't say that. I, I may have an opinion or a feeling like that, but God doesn't call me to spout off and so forth. When I feel it's important, he calls me to be obedient. And obedient means I follow those in charge. And there's been lots of individuals that have led people that have been really lousy leaders. In fact, um, all of them. 
<laughs> There's nobody without sin, right? So, I mean, everybody's got, got issues, right? Including your pastor. So it's, there, there aren't any situations where we could say, well, my expectation is here. They need to meet that. Right? It, when we're honest, we kind of realize we're actually asking the impossible. Um, please keep going uh, in your, uh, uh, in your uh, gospel there. 37 and 38. Somebody read those two. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. With the measure you use it, will be measured back to you. Now, I'm not asking for a show of hands, but I want you to just mentally think this. How many of you would like to be measured by that? Judge like you're ju you judge. God judges you the way you judge others. I'm done. Right? I don't even have to go down that list any further. I'm doomed. Okay? Judge not, condemn not. We do that all the time, condemning people. Forgive people just like we want to be forgiven? How would you like to be forgiven? Over and over again? Unconditionally? Yeah, me too. Do we forgive those around us the same way? No, we're like Peter. How many times do I have to do this? Four times? <laughs> right? I'm, I'm willing to, okay, two times. All right, maybe once, but I'm still going to, you know, play an attack afterwards. Okay? Uh, Jesus, you know, 70 times seven or 77 times, however we see it. And uh, he says, if you want to be forgiven like you forgive, you see, that's what it means to follow me. Um, notice the prognosis that, uh, that Jesus is given here. Um, Luther said this, all of a Christian life is one of repentance. The whole Christian life is one about repentance. It means that you know when we fall short. See, when I read these, okay, I don't come away from those two verses, 37 and 38, and do this. I don't. When I read those verses, I just go, oh, man, do I make mistakes. Right? Man, do I fail. Am I not just a little bit? Just monumental failures. I, I, I condemn people. I hold back forgiveness. I, I don't pray for them. I don't love them. I don't defend them. I don't want to bless them. Um, in fact, it's all the opposite. And so that heaviness, because I am fighting against a world that goes contrary to what God calls us to be, is I recognize God forgive me. I'm that tax collector in the temple courtyard with the Pharisee beating my chest and saying, God, forgive me, I am a sinner. And that's what Luther realized. And, and, but what it does is that when we cry out for repentance, right, this goes all the way back to this. When you cry out for repentance, that's who you find. Otherwise, you're just going to say, well, I'm going to try really hard and be good and, and do enough and I'll erase that sin. Well, we all know how that works, right? Um, I have those conversations. I've shared those with you, um, many of you, that uh, on, on, a, on a bed where someone is potentially breathing their last moments. And I often ask them, are, are, do you believe you're going to be in heaven if God calls you home? And if their answer is in the affirmative, I'll always ask them, why? Why do you believe you're going to be in heaven? And often they will say, believe it or not, I've been pretty good. And, and at those moments, that's what they hang on to. I've been pretty good. And I'm like, really, what, what kind of things have you done? Well, I've been a Christian. Okay, well, what's that mean? I believe. Okay. How'd you, how'd you live that out? Right? And we kind of talk about it a little bit. And then they kind of go, so I, I've, I've been pretty good. Better than my neighbors. Neighbors are awful. <laughs> right? Better than my, my, my uncle or, or whatever. And, and, uh, and I'm like, oh, so you have to be better than other people. Yeah. You have to be better than me? Oh, no, you're a pastor. <laughs> I got news for you. Right? And I said, it's not about being better than somebody else. I said, it, it's about allowing right, that Holy Spirit to touch your heart in such a way as says, Jesus took your sins away. You can't work it off. Right? There's nothing you can do. And so when you and I repent, we come to one of two conclusions. I'm doomed because I can't make this right. Or I'm saved because Jesus did make it right. And that's the point of the struggle. Right? That's the reason that God allows sin and stuff to still permeate this world. He didn't just whisk us away, Adam and Eve, and just kind of go, I'm not going to let you guys be down here because this will go badly. Right? Here's paradise and then this is it. It's all I'm doing. Right? Instead of saying, I want to fix this and point to me. It is Jesus that enables us to do these incredible things. It is not you and I working hard. Right? It is not you and I believing that if, I'm just, if I just work harder, if I just work faster, stronger, whatever the case may be, uh, then I will find redemption and justice. 
Instead, for you and I to live out um, that Christian life, it takes the presence of God within us, which is the gift of baptism, which is the sacrament of the Lord's Supper on a regular basis, which is gathering together as church in a building and hearing the gospel and hearing our sins forgiven and so forth. Um, and so that's one of the main teachings uh, of Jesus in Luke. There's also a pretty strong uh, repetitive teaching about Christ's second coming. Now, I'm not going to have us read this whole section right here, right now, but have it open, right? Luke 17, 20 through 37, uh, and you're going to realize this is, a, uh, this is a prophetic announcement of Jesus, because obviously the second coming is talking about what? End of the world, judgment day, right? When Jesus comes back. Okay, when he left in Acts, right, he ascended back to heaven. The angels came down and, and the disciples go, what are you standing around looking up in the sky for? This isn't what he told you to do. Okay, you got work to do. He's going to come back just like you saw him leave. And when he comes back, he's going to take you to be with him. This is what we celebrate at a funeral of a brother or sister in Christ. Right, that one day Jesus is going to come back. And, and that reward of paradise, that presence of God is going to be what we receive because of his goodness. So here's what I want you to see, um, some things that he says. Four statements that I think are kind of a good summary of what Jesus teaches in Luke. Jesus will return visibly and bodily. And, and that's, again, that, that relational component of Jesus. Luke loved that, uh, clearly, because he talked a great deal about Jesus the man. Not that he was confused at all about the true God, true man relationship, that he's completely God, completely human. But Luke understood that God came in the flesh for a reason, and that's to relate to us. Um, I, I remember when I was in uh, college, Chris and I were in school, um, and there was a friend of ours who played basketball, and his name was Jeff. Jeff was about 6'4", uh, probably about 280 pounds. He's a big guy. His nickname was Big Man. Not a very creative nickname. <laughs> Big man. Now, Jeff uh, was in education with my wife and I both going through education, but Chris and I were secondary education. He was elementary. I remember when he was student teaching nearby Ann Arbor where we went to school, and I got to go visit him because I was doing some of my teacher observation hours, and I went and saw him. He was teaching kindergarten. Now, if you guys have ever seen Kindergarten Cop with Arnold Schwarzenegger, that was big man, right? But one of the most uh, striking images, and it just got etched in my mind, is when a little boy came up and was pulling on Jeff's pant leg. And, and his head came up to Jeff's knee. I mean, he's just, you know, <laughs> you know this, this huge mountain of a man. And so what did Jeff do? He didn't turn and do this. And the kid's craning his neck to see his eye. Jeff got down on both knees, squatted down, sat on his shoes, and hunched over just so that he could get close to eye to eye. That, to me, is what God did through Jesus. He could have just stayed up high and just, all right, here's what I want you to do. Okay. Instead, he came down for 33 years, walked with us, stooped down. Um, one of my favorite passages in Psalms that talks about that is Psalm 116, 1 and 2, um, where, Jesus, uh, where Paul, um, David says, um, I will pray to the Lord uh, because he bends down to hear my cry, right, to hear my petitions. And he says, and therefore I will pray as long as I have breath. Because he says, that's what God does. And, and so that's what, that's what you know, the second coming is. I want you to understand that. It's not just a big neon sign. It's over, right? Everything must go. It's a sale, right? It's a fire sale on the earth. Actually, that'll preach, I think. That might come back. Uh, but Jesus will return bodily and visibly. Uh, there will also be many false messiahs. We know that today. There were back in Jesus' time. Um, it's the reason, if you recall, why there are creeds. Uh, I preached on this a couple weeks ago. Um, there are creeds because there are false teachings that are out there all the time. The reason that people want to debate with me many times, because there's false messiahs out there. Well, I heard, or I believe, or I read, uh, or whatever. And then we're always seems like we're defending uh, and debating. Why? Because there's false teaching going out there about God. And Jesus says there's going to be lots of that. And so I, I don't want you to think that the Christian life is about debate. It isn't, right? Your debate ought to be your actions. Your life ought to be your testimony. Now, if you want to sit down and, and talk with someone, that's one method of doing it. But sometimes I think we put too much pressure on ourselves is I have to verbally convince you that Jesus is the way. 
I, I got to tell you, your life ought to be doing that. And it actually does a much better job than your words. Thirdly, the second coming, there will be signs. Right? There will be signs. I got to tell you, they're not there so that you know when. There just will be signs. Right? Too many people go through the book of Revelation and go, I'm trying to figure this out. It's, it's getting closer. Well, duh. It's closer today than it was yesterday. Right? Um, my father, God rest his soul, um, he told me uh, one day, one particular president that he was not fond of, he said, Eric, I think he's the Antichrist. I, I said, I don't know how serious you are about that, but I, I got to tell you, in the history of mankind, there have been worse people than him. Right? I, I don't know that saying that he is the Antichrist is necessarily, no, I'm, I'm reading Revelation. It fits. <laughs> like, I like, like Stalin and Hitler didn't exactly fit that category. There's been pretty bad people back in time. The point is, is that there is a natural hunger for us to know when it's coming. <laughs> Right? It is. It's just selfish on us. We try to, we try to hedge our bets. Uh, when my dad would leave on Saturdays to go run errands, I've shared this with you guys before, he'd tell us four boys, all right, you guys got some jobs to do. I'm going to run errands and they got to be done before I get back. Hit the car and go. And we're like, how long is he going to be gone? I don't know. I know that I'm in deep water if he comes back and it's not done. So what do I do? I get busy right then. Now, what was kind of funny, sometimes we'd get busy for an hour, two hours. Dad's gone for six. They're like, well, this is kind of a nice way to spend four hours on a morning. I'm out of trouble and riding my bike and so forth. But it's really bad when he comes back in two hours. And you're like, quick sweep, you know. So there will be signs. Thirdly, fourthly, uh, Jesus says he will come like a thief. So that you know that there are signs. You also know uh, that they're not there for us to know the when and the where and the how uh, and so forth. It just simply announces that he will come back. Now, the reason I highlight that is because that is a, a somewhat repetitive theme in Luke. Luke says he has come to save us. Why? To open up heaven for us. What do I care about that? Because hell is an option. Oh, then I want heaven. How should I get to heaven? By trusting in Jesus. What does that look like? Living ready. Being prepared. And, and being prepared is being in faith. It is not sitting at the window watching for the lightning and listening for the, the trumpets. That is not how we live as Christians. It is living in faith. That's what it means to be ready for Jesus' return. It does not mean, hey, I can't go to work today. I'm praying at the dining room table just in case Jesus comes back today. I want to be ready. That's not what it means to be ready. To be ready means that you are going to trust. Well, it's going to get better. That's a, that's a little inside joke. We had that conversation this morning. He knows what that's about. Yeah. I've wanted to do that when one of you gets up during the sermon. I want you to know that. There's a, there's a dark side of me that wants to say, oh, I'm going to get better. Right? I'll apologize to him later. Right. So how about parables? Parables, Jesus uses them to teach a great deal. Uh, stories that most often comfort sinners and smack the self-righteous. Do you see why I like Luke? Right? My job as a pastor is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That's my job. That's your job as well as a Christian. In fact, what I love about parables in Jesus is that he uses examples to teach these very important truths. If you've been with me just a week or two, you know that's how I teach. Right? I give you an example, or an example in sermons and teaching Bible class, trying to find this way of taking these kind of um, enigmatic concepts of Christianity sometimes and bring it down to earth. That's why God came down in the flesh. How can I take this idea of my love and sacrifice and generosity to you and bring it down to earth? Oh, I know. I will. I'll take on flesh. Be Jesus of Nazareth and come down to you. Um, in Luke 15, by the way, there are more parables in the Gospel of Luke than all the other Gospels. Right? As far as total number of parables. There, there's more in Luke than any place else. Um, what is the main message of Jesus' salvation according to Luke's Gospel here? If you guys, uh, would somebody read that real quick? What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, 
but I found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Very good. I asked you to read it really quick. That was kind of average, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, it'll get better. Wow. <laughs> yeah, man, I, I can empty a room. Yeah, unintentionally, I'm afraid. So the gospel point is to seek and save the lost. That is Luke's message, right? And it's not Luke's message. It's communicating Jesus' message. He goes, this is what Jesus came for, right? Remember we talked week one, we talked about that. He said, I'm going to number myself with the sinners, right? I'm going to own your sin. So I came here to seek and save the lost. Why? Because I'm all about salvation. If Jesus was about what the... Um, I'm going to get a little critical here uh, about the prosperity gospel preachers. If Jesus was all about that, he'd say this life is what matters. You need to be comfortable and, and prosperous and so forth. God wants that for you. That's the prosperity gospel. We hear that from Joel Osteen and Joyce Meyer and things like that. This idea of it's right here and now. It's not about seeking and saving. It's about seeking the face of God so that his influence in your life right now will be a good thing. And, and maybe eternity changing. We don't really worry too much about that. Let's just worry about now, okay? Um, this is a regular rebuke of Jesus. I have come to seek and save the lost. People couldn't rejoice in the grace of God. That's why he said it over and over again. A lot of times it was the religious leaders who said, I don't care about the lost, right? In fact, if you would have told a Pharisee the story of the, of the hundred sheep where one is lost and the 99 are found, they would go, that's still pretty good odds. Right, 99 that, that don't need to repent, that's really good. I'd, I'd love it if we had 99% of our church body together. Right? Wouldn't we say that that's pretty excellent? And Jesus goes, actually, it's that one that I'm most concerned with. That's the one that's lost. Now, in Luke 15, you guys see actually three stories there. Um, you see the, uh, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and what's the third one? The lost son. The lost son, the prodigal son. Okay? And so um, if we were to read that, I'm not going to go through it. I, I'm going to assume... That you, many of you, most of you, all of you know um, the prodigal son. Son comes to his father and says, I don't want to wait for you to die. I'm, I'm going to paraphrase here. So I want my inheritance, which basically was one third of what the man had. Because the older brother, according to Jewish law, would have got a double portion of his inheritance. Okay. Now, this man, understand, doesn't have all his inheritance in gold. It would have been his land, it would have been the animals, it would have been some money. So this father, willing to give him third of his you know, net worth, would have had to navigate that. I had to sell things, get rid of things, whatever, in order for this son of mine to have this. He goes off to a foreign land, that's symbolic, right, far away from the father, and he lives a terrible life, dishonors his father, his name is God, and so forth. Um, uh, a famine hits, he's feeding pigs. For a Jew, worst possible job. Right, because of how they feel about pigs, right? And he said, I wish I was even eating pig food. I am so hungry. Talk about being demoralized as a Jew. And and God's obviously kind of peppering that in a little bit, right? He's writing the story. Uh, and eventually he comes back, apologizes to his father, father goes, I'm not hearing it. I love you. I'm glad you're back. Right? And it's this wonderful story. And we kind of go, it's like, oh, it's like the lost sheep, the son was. It's like the lost um, a coin and so forth. It is not about that. The point of that story is the older brother. That's the point of the prodigal son. The, the, the prodigal son story is all, because why would you tell three stories exactly the same? If you lost a sheep, go find it and rejoice with people. If you lost a coin out of 10, find it and then you'll rejoice with people. If you lose a son, have him come back, right, and rejoice with him. So what do we do as Christians? Go look for lost things. Now that's true, but I want you to, would you guys, if you're looking at Luke 15, I hope you are, um, I want you to look at verses 1 and 2. Somebody read that for me. 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Right, so who are these stories aimed at? Lost. Well, the self-righteous. He's aiming at the Pharisees and the tax collectors. It's about the lost, right? That's what it's about. But who is he teaching? They're grumbling like, he wants to take care of the lost and all this kind of stuff. You can imagine Jesus kind of straightens up and goes, a man had a hundred sheep. He lost one. What does he do? Right? 
And they're like, well, you got 99. Cut your losses. Everything's fine. He goes out and he finds the one. What? One dumb sheep? Right? And they are dumb, by the way. All right? Um, I, I say that lovingly. It's how God made them, evidently. Just small, smaller brain. And uh, the point is, is it is all about the elder brother. All about the older brother. Because the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law, they're the older brother. If you know the story, they go, well, what's going on? Well, they're having a big party for your younger brother who was lost, and dad's welcomed him back in, and he's loving him, he's got a party and so forth. And he goes to dad, he doesn't go, thank the Lord, he's back. What a blessing. He goes, where's my party? I've been here the whole time. You never let me have a party. I had a curfew, couldn't use the camel anytime I wanted to. I mean, this has been hard, right? <laughs> Keys to the camel are always locked up, okay? I'm venting some of my own past there. <laughs> the point is, is this is all about the Pharisees. So let me just kind of walk this through a little bit. Luke 18, 9. Let's go there, please. Luke 18, 9. <laughs> He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Right. So um, <laughs> the religious leaders by Luke 18, they're still struggling. They still struggle understanding. He's like, I have told you a story about sheep and a story about coins and a story about a lost son. And they're like going, so what do you think so important, Lord? Okay. Um, Let's review, right? So in fact, I, I think it's this way. When I look at Luke 15, for example, I think it's a brilliant teaching style, um, kind of a trifecta of stories, sheep, coins, lost son. And it starts general, vague, right? You should look for lost things. Like sheep? No, okay. So there's a gal who's lost 10, you know, 10 coins, lost a coin. Okay, so sheep and coins we should be looking for. <sighs> no, all right, there's a man with two sons. Right? You can see one example after the other until they finally get to the point at the end of the prodigal son and say, you are that man. You're that older brother. I don't get it. <laughs> and so here it is in Luke 18. He's still stood. God, he want, Jesus wants them to come along and wants them to understand. Um, if you're there at 18, would you read somebody 9 through 14? He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men were up, went up together to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So in the stories prior to this, were there ever Pharisees in the stories? Did the Pharisees lose their sheep? Pharisees lose a coin? Pharisees' son go off and live a bad life? And so Jesus is kind of like going, all right, allow me to be blunt. There is a Pharisee and a tax collector that go to pray at the temple. Okay, I see where you're going with this. And the Pharisee prays thusly, and the tax collector prays thusly, and the tax collector goes away redeemed. And they're like, is that about us? <laughs> so you're saying, wait a second, hey, we're Pharisees, right? You met other Pharisees, right? Uh, you can imagine now, so here's the, here's the problem. This is a trap for sinners when we read that story because folks we are the Pharisees right remember when I said in the very beginning when Jesus kind of laid that out pray for those that persecute you right turn the other cheek bless those that's that's what it means to follow Jesus and it's hard that's why God gives us the Holy Spirit to work in us that sanctification that working in our hearts but when we read this story don't we kind of look at that and go oh I'm the tax collector I'm the one that goes, Lord, forgive me. I, I don't deserve your grace. Now, I, don't, I don't mean that we, we don't love grace and sometimes we visit it and we kind of, you know, stick our toe in it once in a while and kind of go, that's nice. Sometimes you come away from worship and go, boy, that really challenged me. I'm going to try to make some changes in my life and so forth. But the problem is, is that story is a trap for us, just like it was for the Pharisees. They hear the story and they're like, well, that's the right way to pray. 
and, and then we realize that we actually are those egotistical ones. Let me wrap it up. Parables can stand on their own um, as we take a parable out of Scripture, but it, you're only going to really benefit it if you understand the whole. Um, if you just pull the, the parable of the lost sheep out without understanding who that's toward and what it's about, we'll miss some of the deeper truths. If, if you don't understand who the Samaritans are, then the story of the Good Samaritan doesn't have the same impact. You just go, well, some strange guy helped this guy, and he was a good guy for doing it. That's what we ought to do. Instead of when you hear that story, you realize Jesus is the Samaritan, right? And we are the beaten, bloodied man that is near death. And he saves us, even though people opposed him and, and didn't like him and didn't respect him and so forth. Lastly, ethical teaching of Jesus shows the strictness of the law. Would somebody quickly, Matthew 5, 28. All right, so this is fine-tuning the old sixth commandment. Do not commit adultery. Jesus says, you even think about it. All right, you look at someone with lust in your heart, you've broken that commandment. A lot of times we say, oh, when Jesus comes, he kind of brings grace and forgiveness. So the hardness of the, of the commandments kind of gets watered down and softened. Does that sound soft to you? Do not commit adultery. In fact, don't even think about it. Whoa! Right? I the do not commit it. I was okay with. I'm like, I think I can do that or not do that. Right? I can control that. But even think about it with lust in my boy, that's a struggle. We all struggle with that in some way. And so we don't think that the ethical teaching of Jesus makes the Christian walk easier or 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 lacks substance. In fact, Jesus brings it, goes, listen, even thinking evil thoughts leads you in a place that eventually will cause you to fall away. That's why we catch things in early uh, sense of that. Finally, therefore, church, we are driven to focus on grace as we look at Jesus' teaching in Luke and to focus on our neighbor. <laughs> That's, uh, it, it's interesting how that lines up with the sermon for today. We talk about love God and love others. And uh, Jesus is the action of love from God down to us. And he says, now I want you to think about those around you. You are the light in this world. You are the salt in this world. Um, you make an example of me to this world because you bear my image. Let's close in a word of prayer. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your love and uh, for your truth. Uh, I thank you for your example through the Gospel of Luke. Lord, I pray that lights go on for us, Holy Spirit lights, uh, that we gain not only understanding but also discernment of how to live out this life. Lord, I pray that we recognize that it's hard. And we ask you for help because that's where the help comes from. Let us not be pious. Let us not be self-righteous. But instead, let us be like that tax collector that says, woe is me. And we need your grace and we need uh, the new life that you offer so that we can impact our neighbors around us. God, these things we pray in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.